Well, as we start off on our study of biology, the first thing I want to make sure you understand is the method that I mentioned in yesterday's lesson plans as far as to um, using flashcards to help you master all of the vocabulary words that you're going to find in biology. There are a lot of vocabulary words in biology, just a lot of terminology that you've got to be familiar with before you can even begin to understand the material. And I tend to recommend this particular method to my students. If you have found um, another way to learn vocabulary words so that they really stick in your head, that's fine. But this is a method that I have found that works very, very well with my students. Um, the vocabulary words that you need to master um, are the ones that you will find in your book. They are in blueprint and they are centered in the text with the definition. And so those, anytime you see a word that looks like that in the textbook, that is a word that you are gonna be expected to know. Now, here's what I recommend. For each word, for example, the first word in your text is biology. And so I would take two different cards and on one card, I'd write the word biology, and then I would have nothing on the back. On the other card, I'd write the word biology on the front, and I'd write the definition on the back, study of life. And I would do that for all of the different words that are in the section. And now here's what you're gonna do with that. So your words that don't have any definitions on them, you're gonna take those, and you're just going to lay those on the table like this. And so the um, three of the words from the first day would be inference and evidence and biology. And I realize that may be a little small for you to see. Um, then you're also going to have your other cards that have the definition on them. So you're going to take those cards and you're gonna put the definition up and you lay them on the table. So there's one of the definitions, there's a second definition, and there's the third definition. So now what you're gonna do is you're studying is look at the definition and try to match it up with the word. So this one says study of life. Well, study of life, I believe, goes with biology. So I'm gonna move that so that they're next to each other. This next one said uh, logical interpretation based on prior knowledge, experience, or evidence. Uh, that one, I believe, should have been inference, maybe? Does that sound right from what you remember from yesterday? Collected body of data from experiments and observations would match with evidence, okay? So once you have them matched up, then you can take this second card and you can flip it over and you can see if you were right. So there's biology, uh, there's evidence, and then if I flip this one over, then there's the word inference, okay? And then obviously if you don't match them, don't get them matched, you know that you need to work a little bit harder on those definitions to get them mastered. Okay, so I wanted to show you that because sometimes showing is better than, than just reading the instructions and trying to understand what I meant by that. So I wanted to show you that. And in the rest of today's video, what we're gonna be talking about is the scientific method. Now, if you've um, had some science classes before, um, you may have already studied the scientific method. So I hope you're not gonna tune me out. Um, the scientific method, is really what science is all about. A lot of people think science is just a big book full of lots of facts that you have to memorize. And you may even be thinking that now too, especially since I just said there are a lot of words in biology that you have to know. But the idea of science is not a memorization of facts. Science is a process. It is a way of investigating the world around us to try and make sense of it, to try to understand how it works. Um, we also use the scientific method to solve problems. We do that all the time. Um, I can remember when my, one of my boys was, oh, he was probably about three years old, and he decided mid-morning that he was hungry. And he went into the kitchen to get himself a cookie and he discovered that he couldn't, couldn't reach the cookies. So his first thought was, well, I'll pull a chair over because then I should be able to reach the cookies, which by the way, were on top of the refrigerator because I didn't want him to get into them. So he pulls a chair over to the refrigerator and climbs up onto the chair. And once he climbs up there, he realizes that he can't reach the cookies. So he decides he's gonna have to put something else on top of the chair to try and reach the cookies. And so by the time I get into the kitchen, he has stacked 
a chair, and then his little stool that he used in the bathroom so he could reach the sink. And then he put a dump truck on top of that. And he had piled all these things up in his effort to reach the cookie jar. Thankfully, I stopped him before he climbed on top of all this and ended up crashing to the floor. But in making that pile, he had used the scientific method. He made some observations. He discovered that he had a problem. He hypothesized that he was going to be able to reach the cookies if he used the chair. He did an experiment by trying to um, climb up on the chair to see if he could reach it and he couldn't reach it. So he had to go back and say, well, I'm going to have to put something else on there. So even the very simple method of a three-year-old trying to reach the cookie jar is an example of using the scientific method. It's not all necessarily somebody in some lab someplace trying to figure out uh, how to, how to, uh, cure cancer. We use the scientific method every single day of our lives. So uh, I mentioned some of these words already and likely, again, you've probably heard some of this before. I want to go into some of it and to a little bit more detail to make sure that you understand um, some different aspects of the scientific method. So we start out by making observations and what that means is that we are going to be collecting uh, some sort of evidence. Uh, what am I seeing? I Observations are things that I make by seeing, by hearing, by feeling, by touching, by tasting. Um, they're things that I am observing. And there are two specific kinds of observations that we can make. One of them is called a quantitative observation and the other is called a qualitative observation. The way that you can remember the difference is that a quantitative observation has an N in it, and that N um, stands for a number. So a quantitative observation is going to be something like, um, it's two centimeters thick, it's 107 degrees Celsius, okay? It's going to have some sort of a number, some sort of a measurement in it. A qualitative observation does not have a number. So it may be something like the mold is red and fuzzy or um, that whatever that is smells like rotten eggs. So I'm making an observation, but it doesn't have any numbers in it, okay? So those are two types of observations. And um, just as a, a point of reference, if I've given you a memory tip for how to remember something, that N in there helps you remember that there's a number in a quantitative observation, you can probably bet that you're gonna see that question come up later on, okay? Now, this is different. An observation is different than an inference. An inference, um, just like the definition that we had on the board a second ago with the card, an inference means I'm making some sort of interpretation. I'm making an assumption. I'm using the knowledge that I have um, to make some sort of a judgment about something. So I have a picture here um, that I'm gonna ask you to look at. And in this picture, we see uh, a guy who is weightlifting. Now, what is the difference between observations and inferences? Well, what kind of observations could you make from this picture? Well, we could say the guy is wearing glasses. We could say that he has a gray shirt on. We could say that he's wearing blue shorts. Uh, we could say that he is lifting a barbell that has weights on it. So I could make all of those observations. Those are something that I directly see with my eyes. Now, if I want to make an inference, I might look at the picture and go, this guy's really not very strong. And I might make that inference because I know that weights that are heavy are usually much, much larger than these are. And so I'm inferring that because it appears that he is struggling and because he doesn't have much weight on it, therefore he must not be very strong. But that's an inference that I've made. It's a judgment that I've made based on what I'm seeing in the picture. I'm not directly observing it. You can't directly observe that someone is strong. You can only observe that they can lift something or that they can't lift something, okay? Um, I might also make the inference that um, he is really struggling to lift this because of the expression that's on his face. The observation would be he's making a very funny face, 
but the inference is he's struggling to lift the weight. You see the difference between the two? If I'm making an inference, it means that I'm making some sort of a judgment call about what I'm seeing, okay? Now, once I have my observations made, I'm gonna take all those observations and I'm going to make some sort of a hypothesis. The hypothesis that I make is something that's going to attempt to explain the observations that I have. And the key thing about a hypothesis is that it must be testable. You have to be able to say, is this true or is this not true by the time you get finished with it? A lot of times, um, and this isn't always the case, but a lot of times you may see a hypothesis stated um, as an if-then statement. So for example, um, when my kids were um, were all at home, they used to raise pigs for 4-H. And so they wanted their pigs to be very, very muscular um, and, and to you know be good enough to get that blue ribbon at the fair. So the hypothesis they may have made was, if I feed a pig a diet that is high in protein, it will directly increase his muscle mass, make him more muscular. Okay, so that's the hypothesis. So then the next step from that point is to do an experiment. Your experiments uh, have to be repeatable. Um, what that means is that somebody else needs to be able to take the information that you had to take um, the same hypothesis, to take the same, um, same type of situation that you had set up and see if they can get the same results that you did. Now, there are two types of variables in an experiment. A variable is something that you can change uh, to make your experiment work. So you're going to have either an independent variable or you're going to have a dependent variable. The independent variable is the one that the researcher is going to manipulate to see what happens to this variable. So in the example that I gave you, I would say that the protein content of my feed is the independent variable. That's the thing that I'm going to change. And the dependent variable is what happens as a result of this. So the dependent variable here is the percent muscle mass that the pig has, okay? So if I give some pigs a low protein feed and other pigs a high protein feed, then I'm going to directly see how their muscle mass is affected by that. Um, I'm also, in order to have a good experiment, I need to have an experimental group and I need to have a control group. Now, what that means is that um, if I just give all of the pigs a high protein feed, I'm really not going to know if that was the thing that really caused them to, to grow more muscle mass. So I've got to have an experimental group where I give the pigs high protein feed, and then I've got to have a control group where I just give them regular plain old feed, and then I have to see if it makes a difference. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that when you do an experiment, you only want to change one variable at a time. So in this particular case, um, I would want to be sure that all of my pigs are getting the same amount of water. I want to make sure that they're all living in the same type of pen. Um, I want to make sure that the temperature is pretty much the same in all of the pens. I want to make sure that they're all getting the same amount of exercise. And so everything else needs to be the same except for the one variable that I'm testing because that's really the only way that I'm going to be able to check and make sure that um, what I'm testing is actually the thing that is, is making the effect. So um, if the hypothesis is supported, then that means the experiment was a success. Well, I mean, the experiment can be a success whether the hypothesis was supported or not. If I find that the level of protein in my feed doesn't make any difference as far as their muscle mass, then I'm gonna to have to go back up here and make another hypothesis. Maybe I'm gonna to have to go back up and make some more observations and say, well, maybe it looks instead like the pigs who are running around more have more muscle mass, so maybe it's exercise that's affecting that. So um, a failed experiment can tell you just as much as a successful one because you're gonna find out what works and what doesn't. As long as you're only changing 
one thing at a time. Now, once you've done many, many, many experiments, then the scientific process leads us to the place where we can form a scientific theory and a scientific law. Now, in some books, what they tell you is that a theory eventually becomes a law. And that actually is a pretty common mis misconception. It actually isn't true. There's a big difference between theories and laws. Theories tell us why, whereas scientific laws tell us what. So, for example, if you've taken physical science um, already, you've probably talked about um, Newton's first law of motion or you've talked about the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy simply says that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only change form. Well, that didn't tell me why energy is that way. It just said that this is the way it is. Newton's first law of motion says that an object that is at rest will stay at rest. An object that's in motion will stay in motion unless it's acted upon by an outside force. It didn't tell me why that was the case. It just told me that that's what the case is. This is what happens. On the other hand, a scientific theory explains why something is the way it is. So Dalton's atomic theory explains um, the structure of an atom and it explains why that atom behaves the way that it does. Okay, so there is definitely a difference between a scientific theory and a scientific law. Scientific theory explains why, where a scientific law just explains the what. Okay. The big thing to remember in all of this, and you are going to hear this in all different kinds of media and news reports, they'll say science has proven that. And ladies and gentlemen, science does not prove anything. Science cannot prove anything. And I'm gonna write that up here in big letters because I wanna make sure that you understand this point. We can say that the evidence shows that this happens when this is the case, but there's always another experiment we haven't done. There's always another variable that maybe we haven't tested. Um, there's always another environment where maybe we haven't conducted that experiment. And so therefore, science can't ever prove anything. It can help us to learn many things but it can't ever prove anything. So don't let yourself be one of those people that gets fooled when somebody tells you that science has proven that evolution is true or science has proven, <coughs> excuse me, that climate change happens. Don't let anybody tell you that that is because science proved it because it's not true. <laughs>